out and that will help to stop too much frost for Wednesday. Wednesday is a similar day, perhaps a little bit brighter, a better chance of seeing a few glimmers of sunshine. But then also we're going to see a bit more rain coming in across the Western Isles and the Highlands. And that's going to be quite heavy and that will swing across Scotland during Wednesday evening with strengthening winds as well. So the wind's really getting lively on Wednesday night from this area of low pressure. Very blustery in the far north. This weather front moves across the country before high pressure moves back in to bring most of us a dry end to the week. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farrar, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrar's I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. As Europe faces possibly the worst military confrontation since 1945, the British government's response to it has been knocked sideways yet again tonight within the last 45 minutes for the revelation, a birthday bombshell, that on June the 19th, 2020, Boris Johnson held a birthday party during the depths of lockdown for 30 people. We'll ask whether Boris Johnson should survive this. But first, the news. The top stories from the GB Newsroom, I'm Polly Middlehurst. Number 10, as Nigel was saying, has confirmed staff gathered in the Cabinet Room to mark the Prime Minister's birthday on the 19th of July 2020 during the first UK lockdown. According to an ITV News report, up to 30 people are alleged to have attended the event, which was organised by the Prime Minister's wife, Carrie. A spokesperson says the Prime Minister attended the gathering for less than 10 minutes. Later that evening, Nanda 10 confirmed that a second event was held, with the Prime Minister hosting a small number of family and friends outside within Covid rules at the time. They deny ITV News's version of events that that event was held indoors. In international news, a Russian invasion of Ukraine is now imminent, according to the chair of the Defence Committee, Tobias Elwood. That comes as the Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, says Britain would call out any Russian attempts to influence democracy. Russia has over 100,000 troops massed at its border with Ukraine, but denies it's planning any invasion. NATO's Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said today they could deploy additional combat units in Eastern Europe in response to Russia's military build-up on Ukraine's border. We are ready to listen to the Russian security concerns, uh, also in the uh, Baltic region, uh, but we will not compromise on the right for every nation to choose its own path. Jens Stoltenberg. 
Here, the counter-fraud minister, Lord Agnew, has resigned from government over what he's calling the handling of fraudulent COVID business loans. Speaking in the House of Lords this afternoon, he said it would be somewhat dishonest to stay on in his role if he's incapable of doing it properly. He told peers schoolboy errors had been made by allowing companies to receive bounce-back loans when those companies weren't even trading when COVID first struck. The Transport Secretary has announced that post-travel testing in England will be scrapped from the 11th of February, ahead of the half-term school holidays. Speaking in the House of Commons, Grant Shapps said that double vaccinated passengers arriving in the UK will no longer need to take a lateral flow test. Shapps also said travel testing has outlived its usefulness, as Britain is now one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. Boris Johnson says he's taking Nusrat Ghani's claims extremists extremely seriously. The MP had alleged she was sacked as a junior minister due to concerns about her Muslimness. The Prime Minister has asked the Cabinet to conduct an inquiry into the claims. Ms Ghani has welcomed the investigation. And John Lewis has told staff they'll get full sick pay regardless of their COVID vaccination status. Executive Director Andrew Murphy says the company casts no judgment and that it wouldn't be right to create a link between staff members and vaccine choice and the pay they receive. Other retailers like Next, IKEA and Morrisons have reduced their sick pay for unvaccinated staff. Morrisons and IKEA have stuck to their policies. And just to correct a detail we said in the story earlier, number 10 has confirmed staff gathered in the Cabinet room to mark the Prime Minister's birthday on the 19th of June, not July, as we previously stated. That's all from me on TV Online and on your radio via DAB+. You're with GB News. Now it's Nigel. There are many that believe we are on the verge of the biggest military confrontation in the European time zone since 1945. That is just how serious the situation in the Ukraine is. We know already, of course, uh, that the British have sent some soldiers and some defensive equipment, the Americans considering sending troops, NATO too, NATO members considering sending some troops to help the Ukrainians, the Germans providing an obstruction to that. But whichever way you cut it, this is a very serious situation. And yet, whilst earlier today we did withdraw people, begin to withdraw people from our embassy in Kiev, our response to this once again is in complete and utter chaos as questions about the legitimacy of our government and our Prime Minister have to be asked. Just have a look at this. This was the 10th of June 2020 and this was Boris Johnson speaking to the nation during lockdown. I urge everyone to continue to show restraint and respect the rules which are designed to keep us all safe. And it's only because of the restraint that everyone you've all shown so far uh, that we're able to move gradually out of this lockdown. So please, to repeat what you've heard so many times before, uh, stay alert and maintain social distancing. Keep washing uh, your hands. Restraint. Restraint. No bashes, no passes, no fun. And indeed, on the 13th of June 2020, six days before Boris Johnson's birthday, the Queen watched a scaled-back ceremony for her official birthday on her own without her family by her side. Her Majesty reviewed the annual Troop in the Colour Parade from behind the walls of Windsor Castle with none of it on public view and the parade was conducted adhering to the strict two-metre social distancing guidelines. And yet, now we know, now we know that on the 19th of June, which was Boris Johnson's birthday, a bash was held. Yes, a birthday bash was held. 30 people attended. There was even a cake provided. Boris Johnson had a birthday party for 30 people in the middle of lockdown whilst telling the rest of us we shouldn't dare do such a thing. And this before Sue Gray's report comes out. It was due. We were expecting it on Thursday of this week. Um, but Dominic Cummings, uh, and you know, it's clearly a very destructive game that he's playing. But it was perfectly obvious from what Cummings said this morning 
that he's got more things in the locker to unfold. And frankly, the deeper the problems Boris Johnson gets into, the worse things are for the Conservative Party as they seem to be sinking into a series of mini civil wars just at this moment of potential military confrontation. Well, I want to discuss the Ukraine with somebody who really matters. And joining me now to discuss this is Conservative MP Tobias Elwood, Chairman of the Defence Select Committee and, of course, MP for Bournemouth East. Tobias, thank you for joining us. Of course, I want to talk to you about Ukraine and your views on what Putin's <coughs> next view is. But I must first get a quick response to the Boris Johnson birthday bash, please. Yeah, very sad to read this latest uh, headlines. The nation is rightly very angry by what's happened. We are in a, almost like a holding pattern as we wait for Sue Gray's report. I'm curious as to whether this was allowed to leak out uh, in the build-up to that report or whether she's now going to have to require an extension indeed to include the study of this uh, this latest event. But as you imply in your introduction, it's all a massive distraction from where we really should be focusing. There are both domestic issues, huge challenges uh, nationally, but also internationally that require our attention. So it's very sad to see this, uh, this latest twist, uh, which has been in quite a horrible series of events rolling out for the last three or, three or four months. Yeah, and it makes the country very tough to govern, and it also makes, I guess, our allies question just how much longer they'll be dealing with Boris Johnson. But, Tobias, let's move on. You know, Putin is there, the battle groups are massed on the border. Are you of the opinion that Putin is about to launch not a minor incursion, as uh, the US president slipped up into saying last week, but are you of the view that an all-out assault is imminent? Well, the scale of the attack is questionable. Only one person knows that, and that's Putin himself. But I'd absolutely agree. We've reached the end of the road. A threat is now imminent. It's going to take place, I think, in the next few days. The diplomatic talks have concluded without result. We have to go back to Putin's ultimatum, uh, which was last year, where he demanded NATO back away from Eastern Europe. Of course, NATO wasn't going to agree with that. And that gave Putin the pretext that he can point to his domestic audience to say, NATO is the aggressor. And as you touched on, over 100,000 troops there. These aren't just troops for sort of window dressing or for some statement, but you've got uh, infantry, combat units as well, uh, fast jets have arrived, hospitals with blood banks. This is all very serious that you're actually going into war. And of course, cyber attacks have now commenced. You touched on President Biden's comments. That reflects, I'm afraid, perhaps the weakness, the risk averseness that the West has become, which of course, Putin is playing on. He exploits weakness. He respects strength. I'm pleased to see that Britain is now stepping forward. You know, the Defence Secretary has recognised that there is uh, Ukraine is in its hour of need. It's starting to send hardware. It's just a shame that we and other NATO members didn't start doing this months ago. But the Ukraine, of course, is not a NATO member, uh, which I happen to think to be a good thing, but it's not a NATO member. Do you think the West has the appetite and the stomach for getting involved in military confrontation after 20 years in Afghanistan. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. This is the problem that we face. We've been haunted by what happened in Afghanistan and in Iraq, this idea that we could put boots on the ground. But ultimately, the bigger picture is you have rising authoritarianism across the world, not just Russia, but also China and indeed yeah. Iran. And if good nations don't step forward, where does this lead? You talk about 1945, exactly what happened there is that we appeased. We tried to say, yes, fine, have that bit of space and that will be it. But of course, it doesn't end there. And I wouldn't be surprised if Putin is doing other things across the globe, not indeed in the, in, the, in the Arctic, in the Atlantic, in the Black Sea, and indeed in the Middle East as well. So what happens in Ukraine matters. And we'll see that immediately with the gas prices, because of course, that's, of course, that's why Europe itself is most divided. But most critically, it's because the West, indeed America, is weak. And this is where I'd like Britain to step forward in that spirit of global Britain, show some leadership on the international stage. We're starting to do that. We can certainly do more. Well, you're right. America is weak, and, 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 and he's certainly a very weak and American president when it comes to the Ukraine. His comments last week keep coming back to haunt him. But interestingly, it's the European Union that's the most divided, isn't it? I mean, members such as Estonia, the Baltic states, Poland, looking for a firm response. Um, and Germany, 
appearing to want to stop everybody from doing anything. In foreign policy terms, uh, this means the European Union counts for nothing, surely. Well, I know you want to sort of lure me into this bigger debate about the EU. Politically speaking, the EU, you know, let's allow security, European security, to be led by NATO. NATO is the cornerstone. That's what's kept, I think, uh, you know, our continent safe uh, since the Second World War. And that's what we should be leaning into to make work. And what should be happening uh, in recognizing that the Ukraine is under threat, and I touched on what Russia might do, is to make sure that we bolster our support to those NATO members, particularly in the, the Baltics and Poland and so forth. Tobias, thank you very much indeed for joining us. We'll talk to you again very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. One of the points that Tobias touched on there is something that affects absolutely every single one of you at home, and it is the price of gas, the price of petrol and diesel, uh, and indeed uh, our regularity of supply. And I'm joined again by Clive Moffat, gas consultant and former advisor to the government on energy. Clive, welcome back. Thank you, Nigel. We hear a lot about gas prices. I mean, the truth is the spot price actually has fallen considerably from the high. It has. There's been some adjustment, some profit taking. So roughly half what it got to on its... Roughly half what it got to. Yeah, yeah, but it did get to a ridiculous spiky level. Now, you know, there are many speculating that actually behind all of this, whether Putin really wants to launch a military invasion or not, you know, he could be playing a big game of cat and mouse. He's got the European Union divided, which no doubt will please him. But any kind of conflict presumably leads to a big spike in prices. Yes, any kind of uh, conflict, you're quite right, will in fact scare the markets and we'll see another jump or are going to see another jump in wholesale prices of gas. Um, and that's inevitable, I think. Um, I think as we discussed before, we don't actually physically depend upon a lot of gas from supplies directly. Um, Russia does contribute quite a, a little bit, maybe 5% of LNG supplies to the UK. Yeah. But mostly in the short term, in terms of looking at how do we adjust to vagaries in the market short term, we're reliant upon the world LNG market. Now, what will happen if, God forbid, some conflict does take place and the gas is turned off, then the scramble in Europe for gas could well ricochet around the markets and will ricochet around the markets. And it could well be that not only will prices rise, which will mean for consumers but, further rises in the autumn of this year. But supply? But actual physical supply uh, be, could be threatened because com if this is combined, say, with a high pressure cold spell in the UK and across Europe, there could well be a situation where shippers cannot, A, won't pay the price, or B, can't get the supplies that they need to meet demand in the, term, in the short term, and we are faced with yet another potential gas emergencies announcement from grid. So if the wind doesn't blow, and Britain now very dependent upon a good supply of wind energy, if the wind doesn't blow, the gas could run out. I mean, all of it, to me, it says that it's quite mad, Clive, that we're not self-sufficient on gas, because we could be, couldn't we? It, it, it again raises the issue about whether or not we've reached a point where the government has to recognise that natural gas, and I mean in the medium term, maybe 10 to 20 years, will, it will be important for heat and for power, and that measures need to be taken to underpin uh, the security of gas supply, where if that can be done, and also in terms of power, in terms of security of power supply through the mm. use of gas in power. So we are to sort of, if you like, uh, this has become not just a debate among economists about how quickly can we decarbonize, et cetera. It's become more of a, a security debate, an affordability debate. And... Um, and I think certain action has to be taken. And if we're in potential trouble, Germany is in even worse trouble. Germany's reaction to this is interesting because, as you know, they've cancelled nuclear. And so, to some extent, if the gas is turned off on both the pipelines, both Nord Stream pipelines, then you are in a situation where Germany will simply burn more lignite coal 
Isn't the irony of that? Which, of course, <laughs> is very, very heavy in carbon dioxide. Very much so, yes. And, but you've got... What I'd like to sort of uh, just point it out, that um, there's not a lot that the government can do or any government could do in the very short term in, in terms of mitigating the volatility in the markets mm. caused by what we're discussing. What we need is to reset policy in the medium term and look at how, what measures could be taken to actually underpin greater storage in this country, uh, what meant to more storage investment, what actions could be taken to encourage more investment in gas generation, which has been basically kicked down the path for, for several yep. years now. Yeah. And we need to look at probably, I think the most important issue, which we, you haven't, we haven't discussed last time, is I think we've reached a point in this debate about decarbonisation, net zero and security and affordability, where perhaps it's become very fractious, very emotional on both sides to some extent. There's been cancellation of one side by the other and vice versa. Mm, mm, mm. I think we've reached a point where we might need to depoliticise de energy. I think the case is a, there's a strong case now for looking at the possibility of setting up a strategic energy authority to do what we did in monetary policy, to take a much longer term view, to take the market operation control out of the grid uh, and to reduce the role of off-chem uh, and to actually oversee the long term, if you like, management of energy policy. Mm, interesting. It'd be very interesting to see what the political reaction of that is. Clive Moffat, thank you very much indeed for coming back and joining us. You see, these things really matter. You know, what is going to happen to your gas and electricity bills. Uh, what is going to happen if the supply of natural gas ran out? Militarily, what on earth could happen in the Ukraine? And if Mr Putin was to go into the Ukraine, then what next? These things really, really matter. And yet, once again, it's the Prime Minister telling us to abide by the rules and not abiding by, him, by them himself. Um, and I'm sure this will lead to yet more outrage. Should Boris survive as Prime Minister? Let me know your views, please. Farage at gbnews.uk. In a moment, a big change to the highway code. It's pro-cyclists, it's anti-motorists. We'll discuss all of that in just a moment. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m., Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. Well, over a drink, we have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farage. Dan Wooten, join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. It's the birthday bombshell. Boris Johnson held a party on his birthday in Downing Street 
for 30 people, birthday cakes and all. And I'm asking you, should Boris survive this? Because we've got very important things to discuss on the international stage. And I think this is damaging the credibility of the United Kingdom to speak with a voice of authority. Fiona says, where is the impartiality we were promised on GB News? You are constantly Boris bashing. Let's have news about how well Britain has been doing with trade agreements since Brexit. By the way, Nigel's Good News has been a regular feature on this show, and I've been talking about investment in tech. I've been talking about how well the city's been doing. I've been talking, indeed, about the AUKUS deal, not just trade, but in terms, actually, of security over there in the east of the globe. So I want to talk about all the good things, but I would say this back to you. Lawmakers cannot be lawbreakers. You cannot say to the country, you can't see your parents, you can't go and visit people, you can't have birthday parties, and then do it yourself. And that's the point, and that's why his authority is, whether you like it or not, draining away. Gary on Twitter says, it's pathetic. He shouldn't go, even if he did have a party, the media are complicit in an attempt to oust the PM. I th I'm sure that's true, but it's not just the media, it's voters. And the thing that Boris Johnson has lost with a huge number of people in Britain is trust. And once you lose trust, it's hard to get it back. Stephen says, Boris was chosen because he was a people pleaser. They won by a landslide. He's always been out of his depth. They will throw him to the wolves. The people will then, well, let's see what happens. Kathleen says, yes, he should. It was him we voted for. We did vote for him. Effian says, no, get this corrupt man out of office. John says, Bojo must go. He's bringing our country into disrepute and there'll be no redemption from the public for his lies and contemptuous behaviour. Well, Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, unsurprisingly in the last few moments, has said this is yet more evidence that we have got a prime minister who believes that the rules that he made don't apply to him. And so we've got a prime minister and a government who spend their whole time mopping up sleaze and deceit. Meanwhile, millions of people are struggling to pay their bills. We cannot afford to go on with this chaotic, rudderless government. The prime minister is a national distraction and he's got to go. Well, look, there's no surprise that Keir Starmer uh, says these things. And let me tell you, those of you who think I'm being too critical of Boris Johnson, I wanted him to succeed. I wanted him to do well. Goodness me, I helped him enormously in 2019. Uh, but it's not just me. I repeat the point. What he's losing out there in the constituencies is public trust. And once that's gone, it's very, very tough to get back. Now, there is a very, very fundamental change coming to the Highway Code. It's coming in in a few days' time, and yet no one's talked about it. At least I hadn't heard anything about it until the weekend. And it's going to fundamentally affect, not just in our cities, but actually right across the country, the relationship between motor cars and bicycles. Now, that relationship is pretty fractious already. Um, and I'm not just talking in London, I'm talking in country lanes or wherever it is. Uh, and there is a fair bit of rising road rage. Let's have a look, shall we, at what the new proposals are for the roads. And this is pretty fundamental. So this is a car going along, let's call it a main road, an A road, and the car wants to turn left. What this, what, what this change to the rules is suggesting is that pedestrians who are, who are about to cross that junction now have priority over the car that is turning, and equally, a bicycle has priority too. Now, it seems to me that if that road is quite a busy road, or if that road is a road at which cars are travelling, you know, all at 30 miles an hour or whatever it may be, the likelihood of this is that the car turning left will have to break very, very sharply. I think that will lead to an increase in accidents. The even more remarkable change to the highway code that is coming is cyclists are being told that they can, if they wish, use the centre of the roads to make themselves as visible as possible. Well, it'll certainly make them visible, but my concern is that cars following on will feel they're being slowed up, will, overtake, will undertake dangerous um, manoeuvres to get round those cyclists. Uh, but it also says 
in the highway code. And this is the bit that I just cannot get my head round. It also says that actually they haven't got to use the cycle lanes. It's OK not to use the cycle lane in London and to cycle in the middle of the road. Now, this is all being pushed through by a Conservative government led by Boris Johnson, who are cycling obsessed. But I think the point is that for most of the country, for most of our towns, most of our cities, people's means of getting about isn't by bicycle, it is by car. There's about 35 million cars out there on the road. And, and to think about a fundamental change to road use, to think about that uh, without really having a public education campaign or, or any form of public debate strikes me as being madness. Joining me first to discuss this is Neil Gregg, Director of Policy and Research at the road safety charity IAM Road Safety. Neil, I presume that you have been consulted on these changes to the highway code. We have. There was a full consultation process last year, in fact, almost a year and a half ago. Um, the problem with the consultation process is it was flawed from the beginning because the consultation document, which has become the new highway code, was written by a closed group of cycling and pedestrian organisations and didn't involve anyone else. So it was an unusual consultation in that the highway code you were talking about now was kind of presented as a fait accompli, and that was unusual for consultations. People had a chance. But the other thing about it that was unusual was that there was 20,000 responses, 16,000 of them were organised by the cycling lobby. OK, well, that, that sounds like a normal government consultation. And in terms of the result, I mean, two points, please, I, I, I want you to address on this. Firstly, do you think this will lead to more accidents, to more mo road rage? And secondly, how on earth do we educate drivers in Britain as to what these changes are in such short order? I think that that is the issue. I think in the short term, this could lead to more conflict because there will be certain people who know the rules and will then exercise their right to those rules, for example, to go ahead at junctions, to cross the road and, and wait for the cars to, to stop for them. And there will others, particularly drivers, who won't know the rules. And of course, if you get those two coming together at the wrong time in the wrong place, then you have recipe for conflict. And the second point is, this is a huge challenge because every single road user has to know about this. Every cyclist, every pedestrian, every driver of every, any kind of vehicle. And of course, none of them, apart from those who are 17, 18 at the moment, will pick up a highway code on a regular basis and read it because they don't have to. So there's a huge challenge here. And the government have left it a bit late in our view for something that's happening on Saturday to have any kind of campaign at all. So would the, would, would the sensible thing to do to be, say, to, to delay this three months and have, and have a bigger debate about it? I think the sensible thing to do would be to phase it in in some way. So, you know, people know it's happening now because there's been a lot of media coverage. They don't know the full detail because we've had no official uh, diagrams. All the things you've shown are, have been put together by journalists. They haven't been put together by the Department of Transport. Yeah. So I think we, we do need a phased campaign. But certainly, you know, introducing it on Saturday without a campaign from the government is a really bad move. Yep, I rather agree. Neil Gregg, thank you very much indeed. Well, with me in the studio to discuss this is climate columnist for The Independent, Donak McCarthy. Before we get to the rights and wrongs, of, good evening. Before we get to the rights and wrongs of this, you know, whether we should be doing it or shouldn't be doing it, isn't the point that the consultation was derisory? I mean, I didn't even know there was a consultation. And that if it's coming in this Saturday, and, you know, I mean, I'm a road user, I'm a driver, I didn't find out about this till yesterday. This is quite dangerous, isn't it, doing it this way? I think that we can all agree that when the government is introducing changes to the highway code, it should actually have a publicity came about it. I would actually also add, for most drivers, it's been 30 years, for many of us, since we did... And we looked at the code at all. It's true, isn't it? <laughs> so I think it would be a good idea if twice a year the government, Department of Transport, launched a publicity campaign, about maybe two or three of the rules, twice a year, to remind drivers what the code says. So I think all three of us agree there is an education campaign required. So is there an argument we should postpone this for three months to have that... Ca actually, number one, to have a debate about some of these rules, which I'll come to in a moment with you, but to have a debate about these rules. But number two, this is quite a fundamental change. I think you're exaggerating the change. What actually is, is proposed is actually what's taught to every driver in every good driving school and every kid in school in bikeability. What the change says is just codifying what's good practice. If you're driving 
and you're passing a cyclist, whether a pensioner or a kid, they can wobble, they can hit, hit a, 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 a hole in, in the in a pothole. And you have to be one and a half metres from them to do that safely. That's what we've always been taught in driving school and at school in bikeability. And this code just codifies that. It's good practice, and I think it would be a shame to delay that. But if I'm turning left off a, off a fairly busy A road, sure. and there are pedestrians on the corner, sure. I assume that I've got right of way, not them. And that is very dangerous, because if we have confusion over something like that, that is, you know, well, potentially what, bad news. Yeah, what I heard to you in your introduction, I, I think I'd be very concerned about a driver turning a corner where they can't see it around the corner at 30 miles per hour. That's bad driving. Well, they would be going at 30 and they would slow to 20 as they, as they well, took the they corner. Well, they slow down to more but like 10 or 15 if you're turning around. You, you can't, can't do see. that on a busy road. You can't turn at 30 miles per hour. To, uh, you're suggesting road. we drive at 10 miles an hour and 80 No, I'm saying when you're turn turning left. a corner, you, you have to be able to see well, where you're going. Well, I, I, I think all of this is crazy. Now, look, haven't we got our priorities wrong? Aren't we just thinking London? You know, it's London and one or two of our big cities where people drive, uh, go around on, mo on, on bicycles in large numbers. The rest of the country... They go to work by car, don't they? I think what we have to recognise across the country is that the number of drivers on our roads has exploded, our cities are becoming congested, and actually we can't continue the way we go we're going if we want to have a good quality of life in our cities, and we want the economies to be thriving in our cities. Congestion causes problems for the economy. You can get 12,000 cyclists down a road and the same an hour, and you get 2,000, you get 2,000 going down a road. It is incredibly inefficient economically and physically to use cars instead of... Donica, when I come here, right, we drive up Park Lane, right? There's a blooming great big cycleway. Next to it's Hyde Park with quite big cycleways okay. and they've reduced the car usage on Park Lane to one single lane. This new legislation suggests that if they want, bicycle can, bicycles could use the middle of that lane. Isn't the anti-car bias getting too strong? No, actually, if you look at it, it's the other way around. 99% of the budget, 99% of the budget, transport budget, is spent on cars and right. other things. Cycles get less than 1%. But they're not paying anything to and use the roads, are they? We are. We're actually paying taxes just like everybody else. You're not paying road tax. But we're not paying for the... We're paying for the hospitals that the, that the people are, are... who call Because of our car culture... Oh, hang hospitals. on. We're all doing that. No, no. Yeah, we are all paying for, for the cost of motoring. If you look at... The Glasgow University did a study, and they found that... With people who cycle regularly have a 40% reduction in heart disease, 40% reduction in, in lung disease. Maybe they do. And it's an incredible it's not way practical, of improving your But health. it's not practical for everyone, is it? It's not practical for everyone. Neither is driving, neither is... For, so for an elderly person who doesn't drive any longer, who can cycle still, that's really important. Well, I'll tell you what. Kids go to school. I'll tell you what. Do, Tonica, do one thing for me. Can you tell cyclists where there are cycle lanes to blooming well use them and get off the roads? Well, if we had cycle lanes... Well, I'm saying where we do have cycle lanes. Well, less than 0.1% of our roads are cycle lanes, Nigel. So if we had them, there would be a culture of using them. Like many modern cities in, in, in France, Germany, America, they're putting in cycle lanes because they understand a modern city to be economically effective, health effects and good quality of life. If you have cycling infrastructure, yep. it takes the cars off the road and then the economy works better. All right. Well, look, I tell you what. We won't agree on everything, but we will all agree that a fundamental change to the Highway Code should not happen without open consultation and debate and should not be coming in this Saturday when most of the country don't know about it. Thank you Thank for joining you. me here in the studio. Right, it is now time for my What the Farage moment. Let's go to New Zealand. This is unbelievable. Jacinda Ardern. She's the darling of the Liberal left all across the Western world. And she likes lockdowns. My goodness gracious me, she does. And her next proposal is unbelievable. After just nine cases of Omicron in New Zealand, she is bringing in new legislation. And that legislation says that if you come into contact with somebody with COVID, you have to isolate for 24 days. No, I'm not making it up. You have to isolate for 24 days. There must be something in the drinking water down under, both in Australia and New Zealand. They've literally gone mad. Now, my What the Farage moment, and this takes some believing, is one of the hard lockdowners, of course, is Mark Drakeford. He's the boss in Wales, but he suggested he might even take on NHS staff if they lose their jobs in England. Well, I'm joined by Lilith, paramedic and founder of NHS 100,000. 
Good Hello. evening. Hello, thank you for having me on. I'm pleased to see you, and I have been covering this story uh, because I do believe in freedom of choice. Yeah. And I have come to understand that even if you have had three jabs, you can still catch the virus and you can still pass it on. You had a march on Saturday. Yes. How many people attended that? Quite a lot. Uh, it looked like a couple hundred thousand, I believe. Yeah. Well, Maybe not. Well, well those I'm that, very all, that organised like marches always <laughs> over exaggerate. <laughs> now, look, Lilith, you are being irresponsible, you are being selfish, you owe it to your patients to get yourself vaccinated because they will in turn be safer. That is what the government is saying to you. It is what the government is saying. Uh, I think the, the core issue of this is the ability to choose. So whether you choose to be vaccinated or not, what the government is saying is that these vaccines are quite effective in protecting you from this disease. So in effect, you should be protected from, uh, from COVID. So the patients that we deal with should be comfortable in knowing that their vaccine works for them. For us, it's more about the issue of uh, being able to choose. So for whatever reasons that we've all chosen not to take uh, the vaccine, to be vaccine free, uh, what we want is we want people to have that ability to choose in the end, regardless of the consequences, because the, the most important issue in health is that we do value the patient and their choices, whether or not it's good or bad. But the argument has to be that you should not be able to put those patients in any more danger than they're in already. And they're not. We've been working through a pandemic with no vaccinations, poor PPE, and now that we do have PPE available and we do have very good infection uh, control procedures, which we do follow, th this, is, this is the main... Uh, the main way to stop COVID spread. As a paramedic, how often do you test? So, funnily enough, we don't test very frequently. Uh, it is... And what, and what about a nurse? How often would they test? So, I believe nurses test twice a week. Okay. Yeah. I think for us as paramedics, I think the problem came with finding uh, a certain viral load after infection, which caused positive results. So that's why we stopped testing because the, the, the problem with the NHS at the moment and with the ambulance staff is that we don't have enough staff to cover, uh, cover shifts. So you, the more that you're testing positive, the less that we're on road. And I think managers saw that. So they kind of reduced the urge to test. The care sector saw, we don't know whether it's 20 or 30 or 35,000 people left the care sector because they didn't want to get the vaccine. Mm. You're clearly prepared to lose your job if it comes to it. Yes. Do you think you can win this battle against the government? I would like to think so. There's a big uprising for, you know, just for choice, even people who have chosen to be vaccinated or not. Uh, they, we do value choice and it shouldn't ever be forced because it might start off with the COVID vaccines today. Tomorrow it could be the flu vaccines, which doesn't have a high uptake in the healthcare sector. Next might be taking aspirin every single day to protect you from okay, blood Okay, so this clots. is a bigger question. This for you is a question of liberty as yeah. opposed to this vaccine yeah, itself. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to watch this case with great interest. Who knows, Mark Drakeford, he might give you a job down in Cardiff. So a you never know. A few of us are looking up there. Lilith, thank you very much <laughs> indeed for joining us. More reaction to this birthday bombshell. Paul says, what is the alternative? Starmer, Labour's behaviour during Brexit is unforgivable. Well, I agree with that. Another viewer says, he will survive. Mm, for how long? Ian says, Johnson should go, not just for parties, but also for net zero, chaos, inaction over immigration and his socialist big government policies. Coming up in a moment, on a happier note, I really do believe, I'm going to be joined by celebrity chef and TV presenter, Tonya Buxton. It should be fun. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. 
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints were over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. It's party time here at GB News, not Downing Street. And the pub is open. Antonia Buxton, celebrity chef and TV presenter and political campaigner and many other things joins me on Talking Pints. Cheers. Antonia, very good Cheers. I'm gonna sit there. to see you. Now, of course, <clears throat> my Greek kitchen, my Cypriot kitchen and uh, travel. And I mean, goodness knows how many TV programmes you've presented over the years. Um, you always do it with effervescence and fun. But Thanks. the interesting but the interesting thing is that actually you're an historian. Yes. You're a classicist. That's actually what I wanted to do initially before the My Greek Kitchens and the My Cypriot Kitchens is I wanted to do this um, program called In the Steps of Alexander and following the steps of Spice Trails of Alexandra and uh, Alexander the Great and and it somehow ended up being a food show <laughs> but you know in every single well, one let's of have my a look. shows. Let's have a look okay, at you on the look. road shall we? Wow! It's nearly it ready. Smells amazing! So here we go. Mommy? Oh, oh, oh. Lovely jubbly. You know what? I'm in my 40s now. Uh, he's got a lot of faults, Eddie. You know, he's not perfect. <laughs> but one thing he's good at is cooking. <laughs> so classical history out of the window, yeah. and suddenly it's travel and it's food. But I was thinking, you know, given that you've studied the classics, that you and Boris have a bit in common. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I floored you with that one. <laughs> I think actually, is it, doesn't uh, Boris have uh, some Turkish origins? Or uh, in he his, does. His I think I think a grandfather or a great grandfather. So, yeah. Yes, they, the Ottomans when they took over Cyprus and Greece. <laughs> maybe when we were polemic, even then. But you could have gone on to teaching or whatever. But it's been TV. But mm -hmm. it's particularly. I was a school teacher though, Nigel. Oh, were you? Yes, I was a school teacher for eight years. A primary school teacher in Tottenham. Wow. Before I changed careers at the age of 32. What is it about Greek food in particular? I mean, what is so special? I mean, and, you know, I know you, you, we, we, we had lunch last year together at a Greek restaurant. It was yeah. magnificent. What is it about Greek food? I mean, you seem to have a, a passion for it, a belief in it. The thing about Greek food is, and what you need to understand, is that everybody talks about the Mediterranean diet. But the studies yeah. that were done on the Mediterranean diet were actually the studies done in Crete in the 1970s. So the Spanish and the Italians and all the other Mediterraneans jumped into this great diet for you. But actually, it was the Greek diet. And it was a lot of olive oil. It's eating off the land. It's eating seasonally, eating colourful food and having a predominantly kind of vegan diet. So it's kind of 80-20 um, because they eat from nature. And so they might flavour their food with something some salted pork or something like that, but it, it wasn't these great big lumps that you think of, when you think of Greek food, you think of souvlaki, don't you? And it's mm. huge amounts of meat. Mm. My parents grew up eating meat maybe once a month. Wow. So it's so it's it's a really healthy diet. It's indigenous. Are you saying it's organic? Meat's are you saying meat's unhealthy? No, meat is very very good for you. I'm a complete carnivore, but it's where you get your meat from. You know the type of meat that we're eating now. This kind of 
farmed and 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 it's it's cruel on the animal and it's actually not good for us at all they're pumped full of hormones they've got lots of antibiotics because they don't look after the animal properly so the fast meat is bad for you but if you get your meat like i do from a, a local farm and you know where it comes from it's very good for you and you don't have to eat it often and i buy all of that i get the argument i understand it and yet Difficulty is, Tonya, to eat like that mm -hmm. is expensive. It is, yeah, it is. So what does, and, and you know, we've got a, a, a massive obesity crisis growing, yeah. not just in this country, but actually right across the world. Although I think when it comes to Europe, we're doing pretty, because in Europe, we're, we're, we're worse, I think, than, than well, our French and German we're, counterparts. we're doing badly. The thing is, is the main thing about all of this is to cook from scratch. Okay, you cook from scratch, and actually to, to cook... Um, relatively cheaply from scratch. So, And when it comes to getting beans and pulses and learning quite basic recipes, you can feed a family that, I've got four children, there's six of us, a minimum, I cook a minimum of six. So, you know, it is expensive to, to buy that type of meat. So you don't have it that often. You just have it maybe once a week and then you find ways to work around it. And it is all about cooking from scratch. But the argument... Even if you're using fats, even if you're using oils, all of that, as long as you start cooking from scratch, you will avoid this obesity. But the working mum... You know, I was a working mum. ...is coming home and struggling for time. I that. Uh, I there's, there's a takeaway culture. Mm. That's the problem. Uh, that has absolutely got a grip on uh, the minds of many, many millions of people. I mean, you are, when it comes to cooking from scratch, you are talking here about a massive, I guess, a re-education campaign. Well, you know, instead of spending that 400 million that the government did on brainwashing us to be fearful, if they'd spent just half of that teaching people how to cook from scratch and, and looking after themselves, we wouldn't be in the trouble we're in now. That's one of the biggest problems as far as I'm concerned. We've never really... I've been harping on about this for over 25 years. Teach people how to cook from scratch. It's not that difficult. It just takes a little bit more organisation. Mm. And I'm, I'm a working mother and I worked at the school timetable, which is a long day and it's hard. And I had young children at home and I still managed to get organised. It does take a little bit more effort, but what you get with that effort is huge. Now, you are, you know, everything you pursue, you do <laughs> with the most incredible gusto <laughs> and <you>. passion. Um, <laughs> and... That really comes into current affairs, mm -hmm. a debate, uh, politics, or on the edge of politics. I don't think of myself as political, but I do think of myself of having to speak up for things that I feel. But you're campaigning wrong. at the moment, aren't you? I have been. I've, I was one of the uh, earlier signatories for the uh, Together Declaration, which we took to Downing Street on Monday and handed it over. And it's two declarations, one against vaccine passports, one against vaccine mandates. There were 370,000 signatures on there mm -hmm. because... It's immoral, it's illogical, and um, we have to fight for our children. We have to have freedom of choice in this country. And for me, it's not just about the freedom of choice, it's the illogicalness of these mandates. I think the tide's turning. I, I think, think something has, has changed in the course of the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and I think that argument for freedom of choice, in fact, if you compare us to the rest of Europe, we're leading the way. I mean, the madness in New Zealand... I mean, she's now talking about 24-day lockdowns. I think there are some leaders that have gone insane on power. And this is what COVID's done. It's given people in power too much power. So just, uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, it, they've gone insane on power. And they've got to stop what they're doing and listen to their people and, and think about what what is our humanity about? When people start shouting at me, oh, you don't care about COVID deaths or you this and all the things that I get called, I just stop and say, I want the same as you. We want the best for our children. We're not enemies here. But somewhere along the line, the mindset has changed. And we've got to get people to go back to the old normal and think in the way they used to think before because there has been a mass hypnosis. People are frightened unnecessarily. I think this NHS moment, mm -hmm. you know, we had a paramedic on just a few minutes before you came into the studio. I think this NHS moment is a really big, big battle and a very, very big moment. Uh, do, you think, do you think the NHS staff can win this one? I do, and I think morality will win this one. There we were, clapping our hands for the NHS, mm -hmm. and they didn't know what they were going into. They really didn't know. We didn't know about this virus then. And we were told that this virus doesn't behave like a normal virus, virus does. So we were told to doubt ourselves and be more fearful. And yet they, these people still went to work every single day. And now that they've shown that they are 
warriors in saving us. And we now know this virus is. We've had the latest ONS uh, results have said that without any comorbidities over the past two years, the people that died of COVID, purely of COVID, mm. were 17,400 people. I, yeah. A flu year. Yeah, I a covered, bad I, flu year. Yeah, I covered this last week. I mean, to be fair, it's not quite a flu year because 17,000 people without underlying conditions mm -hmm. wouldn't have died. But in terms of perspective, of closing down the country, of doing and, and all these sacking, things. And sacking these staff that were there. And let's not forget, the big thing for me is that, I, that I've suffered death because of lockdown. My mother-in-law is no longer with us, no longer alive, no longer here to see her grandchildren because of the lockdown. She didn't get her diagnosis for cancer in time. She kept getting stupid telephone consultations with her dreadful GP, and she is now dead. She is dead because of lockdown, and there are going to be far, far greater deaths because of, because of lockdown than there ever was because mm. of COVID. Well, I'm, I fear that's right. And just finally, a thought. It's the birthday bombshell today. Do these Downing Street parties matter or not? For me, what they show is that no one was scared and that they were playing us. It was a nudge unit to keep us in fear so they could control us. So it says to me that we've got to get rid of the fear. I don't care whether he had parties or not. I just want him to return us back to our old normal. There we are. A big campaigning cry there from Tanya Buxton. Let's get back to normal. We'd love to. Thanks for joining me My on pleasure. Talking Points. It's the last couple of minutes of a very busy show. Yep, it's Barrage the Farage. Here goes. Dave asks, which minister do you think will be the first to break ranks and resign? Well, one did resign today. Lord Agnew resigned today in the House of Lords. Junior Treasury Minister, successful businessman, and he is as appalled as I am that £4.3 billion of taxpayers' money has been written off because it was given out to fraudsters in the form of bounce-back loans and much else. That's the first one gone. Camilla asks, now that Plan B has been cancelled, one of the wrong directions Lord Frost objected to, is there any chance he could return somehow? What did you make of Lord Frost and his, in his interventions, Tanya? Uh, I think that his interventions were correct and it was, he was right to speak up in the way he did. He's got a big following out there now. Yeah. He really has. Adam asks, is the choice for UK voters currently for the least bad option rather than the best one for the country? It's been the least bad one for generations, as long as people can remember. And all the while we have a first-past-the-post system, as opposed to being able to vote for what you really believe in, it will go on being that way. But, hey, that's a whole bigger debate. David asks... With all that is happening in Westminster, how can the common person have a morsel of trust in politicians? That question is the first one I've had so far on the show that I simply can't answer. Help? No, we don't have any trust in them. We don't believe them anymore. They have to prove themselves to us. They have to start again. I think that's right. And I think, actually, that Brexit was a moment when we thought, wow, we've wrestled control away from the politicians. They now will listen to us. Uh, and sadly, they're not. Are you for or against the Ukraine joining NATO? I said since 2010 that encouraging the Ukraine to join the European Union and or to join NATO was absolute, complete madness. It was pushed by Osborne, Cameron and all of them. And the point about the Russian bear is don't poke it with a stick. It doesn't make any sense. And that is not, by the way, a pro-Putin comment. It's a pro-common sense comment. I'll be back tomorrow. Goodness knows what revelations we'll get overnight. Coming up next, it's Mark Stein. First, though, of course, the all-important weather. Good evening. A remarkably similar day tomorrow. It's, again, going to be cold. If anything, probably feeling a little colder than today. Grey skies for the majority, but not much rain around. Main exception to the dry story will be across the northwest of Scotland, where we do have these weak weather fronts. High pressure has been dominating, and under it, we've got a lot of cloud trapped, and it's not really shifting very far because the winds are light. We've seen some breaks in the cloud over northeast England, eastern Scotland, and if we keep those breaks tonight, we could easily see temperatures dropping below freezing. But even where it's cloudy, it's uh, going to turn quite cold. Temperatures dropping down close to freezing zero there in Hull, one in Cardiff. A little milder in the far northwest, where there will be some showery rain at times across the highlands and the northern Isles. That rain uh, likely to pep up a little bit later on on Tuesday. Elsewhere, it's again uh, a rather 
drab, but largely dry day. We should see some breaks in the cloud across Aberdeenshire. Again, northeast England may see a bit of sunshine, uh, but for most it will be a grey day. And temperatures lower than today's. Look at that, only three or four in Birmingham and London. Again, the top temperature, probably Aberdeenshire with some sunshine here, nine or ten is possible. A little more rain will trickle southwards across Scotland during the evening, but bar the odd bit of drizzle for Glasgow. Uh, not a lot else. A few showers continuing in the far north of Scotland where it will be breezy, but elsewhere the wind's light. We keep a lot of clouds and that will help to stop too much frost for Wednesday. Wednesday's a similar day, perhaps a little bit brighter, a better chance of seeing a few glimmers of sunshine. But then also we're going to see a bit more rain coming in across the Western Isles and the Highlands. And that's going to be quite heavy and that will swing across Scotland during Wednesday evening with strengthening winds as well. So the wind's really getting lively on Wednesday night from this area of low pressure. Very blustery in the far north. This weather front moves across the country before high pressure moves back in to bring most of us a dry end to the week. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning 